Dr. B.F. Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University, has authored such important scientific books as The Behavior of Organisms, Verbal Behavior, The Technology of Teaching, and Contingencies of Reinforcement. In addition, he has written two books of general interest, which have been both widely received and highly controversial, the novel Walden II and Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Included in the many scientific awards bestowed upon him are the Distinguished Scientific Award of the American Psychological Association, membership in the National Academy of Sciences, and the President's Medal of Science. In this film, Dr. Skinner addresses himself to some of the most important issues facing education today. With Dr. Skinner is Dr. John M. Whiteley of Washington University, St. Louis. The issues of freedom and control are among the most misunderstood of your work. I would like to provide the learning behaviors of two children by way of example. One child's learning behavior is characterized by excessive dependence on the teacher at every stage of doing an assignment. The other child's learning behavior is characterized by an independence, an apparent love of learning on its own, a self-starting. Which child is the more free and which child is the more controlled? You see, you have... You phrased the question by referring to one child as dependent on the teacher and the other child is independent. He is independent of the teacher, but he's not independent of the natural world. He has already come under the control of the physical environment which interests him. Uh, Rousseau raised this question 200 years ago. Rousseau didn't like personal dependence. He thought people uh, harmed natural goodness. So he wanted everyone to be dependent on things. But that's the point, that you are dependent on the physical environment just as much as you are dependent on people. I think it, we would agree, I believe, that the child who is exploring uh, the real world around him is, is farther advanced than the child who has to run to the teacher for approval. And uh, the teacher, if, if he's any good, will make sure that, that child shifts his, his dependency to the world of things Otherwise, the teacher would remain essential, and that you don't want. The, every teacher has to wean uh, the student, just as every therapist has to wean his client. You have to, get, you have to break up these dependencies. However, if a child is really not getting much reinforcement out of life, then a little parental or, uh, or instructional approval will be enough to get the child going. But that should be withdrawn. You should, you should break down the control exercised by another person and play up the control exercised by the, the environment. But there's no freedom involved in either case. The child will, will feel free in both cases. In one case, he's free to go and ask the teacher if this is good, and the teacher says yes. In another case, he's free to try something new and something interesting happens. But, uh, and he feels free, but actually, he, in one case, he's still under the control of personal approval. In the other case, he has come under the control of all of the interesting things that happen in the world at large when you, when you uh, begin to explore it. You've written that it, our educational environments are defective. How would teachers within this environment go about helping the child modify his learning behavior? Well, you have to do it, first of all, by constructing the kind of environment <clears throat> that will, will bring the child under some kind of control. If you go into a disrupted classroom where the kids are late in arriving and they run around the room and so on, the teacher may be completely out of control there. What you have to do is to set up some very conspicuous rewarding or reinforcing contingencies. And you can do it with, with by tokens or with credit points or with personal approval or something of that kind. Make sure that the child is reinforced for coming to school for sitting down, getting to work, and learning something. Now, you may have to make it very explicit to begin with, something as conspicuous as a, a, a token that he can pocket in exchange for something at lunch or something like that, but you don't want that to go on forever. You don't want uh, kids to uh, live their lives just to collect tokens any more than we want people to live their lives just collecting money. It's something else again. 
but you can then change from a token system to a credit system, from a credit system just to a bit of approval, a pat on the back, but then you want to get rid of that also and have the, the, the child come under the control of the instructional materials he's working with. Now, I don't think you're going to do that by finding things that are naturally interesting to the child. There are naturally interesting things, but the child is there to learn behaviors which will pay off naturally only much later in his life. For example, beginning reading is not very re rewarding. Uh, you can put four color pictures on every page of, the, of, the, of your reader and that kind of thing, but there are ways in which you can work out contingency so the child is successful very quickly. In, 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 it may be quite arbitrary. You may get some feedback that this is the correct name for that object and so on. And, and, but with these spurious contingencies, call them anything you like, you can begin to build up fluent reading behavior, and then the child will begin to get reinforced, as we all are, from reading enjoyable things. But you can't move to the enjoyable things immediately because they, they aren't enjoyable. He hasn't acquired enough behavior to read in, enjoyably. So you set up artificial uh, contingencies, which might be just approval, but could be much better than that, to build the behaviors, which then come under the control of, of the natural contingencies built into books. We read books for the rewarding things that happen when we read. And you can't start there, but that's where you want the child to move as fast as possible. What are the range of positive reinforcers open to a school? Seems to me schools are operating in a very different way than the one you just described. Yes, that, uh, when you ask yourself as a teacher, as I have at the college level, what have I got that my students want? Uh, sometimes a pretty discouraging uh, question. But you can uh, discover things which will be reinforcing to students at any level. And that has been done. A great deal of progress has been made. There are things in an ordinary, uh, even uh, say a ghetto classroom, lower grades or high school, uh, that can be used as reinforcers. Uh, you can have special foods at lunchtime, uh, access to play space, uh, privileges to associate with um, with other kids of your choice. Uh, more and more of these things are, have been brought into play as as the kinds of contrived reinforcers that can be used temporarily to get the kinds of behavior which will then eventually have their own natural consequences which will be reinforcing. That, that can be done. Uh, fortunately for us all, the human organism is reinforced just for being successful with something. And that has had survival value, and it can be used. If you design instructional materials properly, and I would say that programmed instruction is an example, then mere progress is, is, is reinforcing. What do you mean that programmed instructions designed properly? Well, I mean good programs in which the response you make uh, demands something from you. It's not too easy, but it's still almost always right. And as a result of having made that, you were then able to go on and do something else that you couldn't do before. A, a good instructional program has some built-in reinforcers. If you just leaf through toward the back of the book and see what you don't know, and it's always obvious you don't know it, and then you look back and see what you've covered, and you do know that, that's obvious that something is happening. You're making progress, and before you know it, you know the whole, uh, you know the whole program. And fortunately for us all, the human organism is reinforced by, by successful accomplishment. So on a stage-to-stage -stage basis through this program text, you're rewarded as you go on. It would seem to me, however, that our educational environments are designed very differently, typically. For example, you're punished if you don't do well. Right. The school rewards uh, it's best rewards for those people who accomplish the most, but almost by definition within it, there can only be a few at the top. And children aren't rewarded on a on a day-to-day -day basis for accomplishing as right. much as they can. Well, there are all sorts of things wrong with the contingencies which now prevail, and I want to get away from them just as much as, say, the free school people do, but I think they're going the wrong way. They're not going to be able to get away from these. They always fall back on them eventually. No, you're quite right. It, all the way up through even to graduate school, the average student studies to avoid the consequences of not studying. It's an avoidance kind of or an escape kind of thing. 
Now, how do you find the positive consequences which can take the place of these aversive techniques? That is the whole art of, of managing a classroom, designing instructional materials, and progress is, is being made. The, the ordinary positive reinforcers of, of, of marks, grades, graduation, and so on, prizes, honors, medals, and all of that, the contingencies are terrible. They're, those things are not contingent on the behavior that you really want to set up. But uh, you can redesign them and, and, uh, and make progress. You make the point that not everyone can achieve the highest levels and get the, the kudos, the medals, and prizes, which uh, depend upon that. But if you redesign a, a course of instruction, as, for example, uh, the, the system that Fred Keller has designed for reorganizing a college course, then you can take progress through the course as your only examination. There's no final examination. You, you can't get through the course unless you know it because of the way it's designed. And you take uh, an ordinary class with a distribution of IQs, whatever you want to call them these days, and some will breeze through this course and reach the end quickly and get the A and move on to something else. Others will move more slowly, impressed by the end of a term they've only got halfway through. But you don't give them a C, you don't give them anything, come back and take the rest of it next term and you get an A too. And if the material is, is within the range of the population you've already selected for this kind of instruction, then you, everyone, everyone succeeds and everyone must have prizes as in Alice in Wonderland. And in your system, this person would be rewarded by a success and, a, and acquire in the process a desire to learn more on his own. Well, I don't know about the desire to learn more. What he has discovered is that he can improve. He can acquire behavior which makes him more effective. And that acquisition is, is itself reinforcing. And he's then likely to go on if the opportunity presents itself with the same kind of instruction. He'll go on and do more of it and acquire, acquire more, and uh, if you don't watch out, he'll, he'll try to stay too long in your school, and, uh, and you'll have to graduate him forcibly. What do you mean that our schools are really using methods of aversive control? Well, I mean, why does, a, why does a child come to school in the morning? Well, there are truant officers who'll go after him if he doesn't. Now, we've given up on that. There are thousands of children in big cities who don't, don't bother going to school. But that was at one time. You know, when you get to school, why do you sit in your place? Well, you'll be sent to the principal for a talking to, or in, and of course, many schools are now calling for the return of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the birch who get physically punished. Uh, I know schools in this, in this country where if you don't bring your homework in, you hold out your hand and get slapped with the ruler. Now, that can be reversed. Uh, it's such a simple thing to do. I had a very interesting conversation with a with a, a young girl who teaches in the sixth grade in a southern city. She's black, and she teaches mostly black students. And she had this trouble. They wouldn't come in with the homework. And the family wasn't likely to induce them to do their homework. They wouldn't bother doing the work in the classroom. So she had read something that I had written and uh, decided to try it out. What she did was to bring in, at the beginning of the week, a little prize, which she would put up on the shelf where the kids it might be, say, a trend radio or something like that. It cost her five or ten dollars, not any more than that. And then she'd tell the, the children that on Friday afternoon there would be a drawing and someone would get this. And she had a, a jar there. And whenever you brought your work in, you could write your name on a ticket and drop it in the jar. And whenever you did your assignment during the day, you got the arithmetic problems, when you finished, if they were right, you could write your name and drop it in the jar. And Friday afternoon, there would be a drawing, and uh, someone would get it. And she said it changed her life completely. But she was glad to pay five or ten dollars a week for this, because it was so simple. They all brought their homework in. They all sat down and got their work done, you see. And uh, now you say, oh, well, wait a minute, that's not fair that you're bribing them and so on. But they're doing their work, you see, and they can begin to get the natural consequences of being more competent than their brothers and sisters who have been in somebody else's class and haven't had the advantages of, this, uh, of these economic incentives. I would justify that. I'd, you say, well, that's not the natural reason for doing arithmetic, but neither is it natural to, to avoid punishment to do arithmetic, you see. And, the, and as a matter of fact, there is no natural 
reward and learning the multiplication table. Uh, but if you program it the right way so easily, you get some satisfaction out of that, and eventually you get a job where you have to multiply and divide, and uh, then is when you begin to get the natural reinforcers. But this, the school must set up arbitrary, spurious reinforcers to get the behavior there so that it can begin to reach uh, natural reinforcers. What are the consequences of using the kinds of adversive reinforcers that schools currently do? What are the byproducts of this Well, kind that's, of that's the trouble. You can, you can, of course, fortunately for us all, I suppose, because the human race would hardly be where it is now if schools hadn't been severely punitive in the past. The, the birds ride up on the wall up there, and you do this or else. And, of course, people do learn under those conditions, but they also tend to play truant, to escape from this when they can, or to drop out as soon as they're able to legally, or to forget it all as fast as they possibly can, or to vandalize, to attack teachers, to break windows in schools, or just fall into a state of apathy and do nothing. These are all byproducts of aversive control. And although they may have learned something, they're not going to uh, have very much interest in supporting education in the future. What are the problems of the transition between, for a teacher being really a negative reinforcer, a part of a punitive system, what are the transition problems in becoming part of a positive reinforcing system? Well, strange as it may seem, they're not really very difficult. I've seen disrupted classrooms straighten out in a week or two when the teacher discovers that actually he or she has been reinforcing the very behaviors that have been causing trouble. And they learn how to stop that. Could you give an example? Well, for example, uh, the general bullet, leave well enough alone. Here's so-and-so over here, and he's doing his work, so don't go near him. If you go near him, he'll start causing trouble. So what you do is you go and, and pay attention to those who are causing trouble, and, and attention is reinforcing. So you really reinforce people for causing trouble. And you fail to reinforce people for sitting quietly and getting their work done. Now, the thing to do is to pick out those children who are doing what you want them to do, and they're the ones you should go and, and talk to and give a word, something of that kind, and avoid reinforcing the, the troublemakers as much as possible. Another principle is, um, it's very commonly practiced and commonly recommended. If you see a child starting to get into trouble, distract his attention. Well, now, what is distraction? Distraction is something reinforcing. So when you distract the attention of a troublemaker, you're reinforcing his troublemaking. You have to sense these things and to realize what, what you're doing. You've written that the technology that you've been identified with is essentially neutral and that the, it's the uses to which it's put. Um, how within a school can you determine the uses to which it's put? How can parents not feel, for example, that the school is uh, somehow doing things to their children that they don't want done? Or let me phrase that another way. As a parent, I would leery of having people whose values I wasn't sure I agreed with having powerful tools at their disposal to affect uh, my children. Or this is a time in our country when middle-class values are unprecedented attack. The major purveyors of those middle-class values uh, are teachers in the school system yeah. within the context of the school. Um, well, this raises the, the question which is bound to be raised who suppose that education is effective. If it's not effective, then you can get out of all of this. You don't worry about what is happening because you know nothing is going to be mm -hmm. done. But if you could imagine a very powerful educational technology, which I think is available if it were to be used, then you do want to go back and look at these questions. And uh, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I don't particularly like uh, present culture. And I've, uh, in Walden too, I describe what it seems to me an alternative uh, culture. And I don't blame young people today for saying, no, I'm going to take what you're handing me. I don't like that. I'm going to try something of my own. And I think that should be done. In general, in this country, we have profited from a certain diversity. You send your children to parochial schools, they get one kind of thing. You send them to big schools, they get another. You send them to small, upper-class private schools, uh, then they get another one, and so on. You have, the families have a certain amount of choice. 
as to what they are exposing their children to. And that isn't always possible because economic sanctions come into it. But we have protected ourselves against too much regimentation just through the variety of schools available. And in a given school, you get variety just because of the availability or the lack of it of people who can teach various things. I think we do need to get the, the values which underlie an educational system. Now, I don't think the answer is to throw everything out or leave it up to the student, because the student, I think, is least of all able to say what he should be studying. His uh, values will be all tied up with immediate gratification and what he, what he's interested in now, but he's there to acquire behavior which will pay off sometime in the future. And people who've been around likely to know what that future is like and uh, what is to be done. But you're saying that the individual choice comes in, in say the case of, of uh, elementary school children, where their parents can choose the kind of values as represented by different kinds of educational institutions. What the technology does is provide a systematic way to help them accomplish their educational goals. They're not values per se smuggled in, in, the, in under the guise of the technology. No, the values are not in the technology at all. I can imagine a parochial school becoming extremely powerful in teaching religion of a particular kind. I can imagine, um, let us say, a business school becoming extremely powerful in building certain kinds of businessmen for, for our current American way of life, supported by current businesses who want, employ want new employees and uh, which have had this preparation and so on. This, we could, simply by making education powerful, tend to clinch the status quo, which I think would be bad because right now we profit from the fact that people aren't well educated and hence have a certain flexibility when they, when they start living after they've got out of, uh, of education. But if, I think we are at the point where, where we could be much more effective and that means we must take a much closer look at why we are teaching what we're teaching. How would you redesign our elementary and high schools? Well, I think we are in a position to do that if we were allowed to do it. But right now, there are very powerful educational philosophies, particularly those associated with giving the student more freedom, which is a natural reaction against the punitive kind of thing, which I react against also, but which seem to me have no future whatsoever. Why is that? Uh, well, because they, they are mistaking the apparent pleasure and joy of the child doing his thing for progress. Now, it's progress in the sense that it's away from sitting with your hands folded, as I did when I was in first grade, when I wasn't aware, and I sat with my hands folded on the desk. Uh, I, I want to get away from that, too. But I want to give students additional reasons for doing the kinds of things which will develop them, and allow them to, to do the things of which they're capable. Well, that's one, one reason why we're, we're not doing what we're doing now. And I, I would want to, I would want to see a clearer understanding of why students come to school, learn something, remember it, and that kind of thing. And that, that could be done. And it, it better instructional materials can certainly be prepared. And I think right now, the promising thing is, uh, is the application of this to college and the university. The, um, the, the, the Keller system of redesigning a course of instruction is spreading very rapidly and it, I've seen it in work, at work, and, and in actual institutions and there's no question that uh, students become involved in the subject matter and get a great deal more in return for the time and energy they spend. We can, we can do that, we, can, we could redesign the whole thing, but all sorts of problems arise the very, the very structure of the educational establishment is opposed to improvement. How does that operate? Well, supposing you could teach much uh, with the same time and energy. In other words, in the first grade, the child would learn what is now taught in the first and second grades. Mm -hmm. So what does he get in the second grade? Well, he gets the third and fourth. Uh, and this means, of course, your teachers are going to have to be changed and you've got to redesign your schools because some children will do that and some won't. You've got to allow for individual progress. You can no longer have a bunch of students moving along at the same pace. 
the moreover, you dump them on the job market too early because they've finished high school <laughs> at a much earlier age, and then they can't get jobs, and then they get into the streets and become delinquents and all that kind of thing. In England, they have put up the terminal age one year just to protect the job market. They won't admit that, but I think that's what is done. And uh, you, you, don't, you don't want to finish an education any sooner. Our present culture can't take that. Well, that means that you're not to be allowed to improve teaching. Because improving teaching means you're gonna, gonna teach faster. Now, the answer to that, of course, is you teach them a lot more while you're at it. And uh, that, I would, I would say, is, is the thing to do. Where would you begin? Uh, well, I think the only uh, real way to bring about a change is to show what can be done. I, there are all sorts of reasons why people aren't improving education. It causes trouble. There's no particular reason to. A teacher or an administrator isn't going to suffer very much for missing a chance to improve teaching. But mainly, I think it is they don't know what to do. And uh, those uh, who have, have some, some suggestions to make simply have to have to demonstrate that they work, I think. I had hoped that the performance contract thing might, just by bringing into schools uh, specific programs, and to some extent I think uh, it did, but it also brought in a lot of uh, very inadequate proposals and, and, and techniques. And some kind of an entering wedge is needed. I think when teachers see what can be done, they will do it, because teachers are humane people. They want, want students to learn. I, I would just some kind of, of uh, basic research and then some, some projects to demonstrate what can be done. In the, in the medical profession, we now recognize that better practices will not come from practicing physicians. They will come from basic science. In teaching, it is still believed that classroom experience is the source of all wisdom and that if there's going to be anything, it's going to be done by teachers. That isn't true either. We have, have I think, to persuade teachers that they should look for and use new practices coming from outside. And the outside, in that case, means, I think, the psychological laboratory. And what from the psychological laboratory would you single out? Well, I think contingency management, the, the development of better reinforcing contingencies in the classroom is the first step, and the preparation of better uh, instructional material, largely programmed. I think we have to realize that we are preparing people to be effective outside educational institutions, not in educational institutions. This means getting along effectively in the natural environment and in the natural social environment. To say a uh, social environment hasn't been constructed for instructional purposes, and the teacher must turn the child over to the real world just as soon as possible. And it's, it's often attempting to do the wrong thing. I've often used the example of the parent who is so anxious to arouse the child's interest that he does things that the child should have the privilege of doing himself. For example, you buy a gadget that makes an interesting noise, for example, and you bring it home to your small child, and you say, oh, look, and then you make the noise, and you put it down, and then the child imitates you and makes the noise, and that's fine. But you have missed a terrific opportunity is if you put this quietly down allow the child to explore it a bit and suddenly it makes a noise for the first time when the child is operating it then the child will be reinforced for his exploratory behavior and he will go out and explore the rest of nature but you've cut undercut you've, you've destroyed the agencies which would reinforce exploration by demonstrating this and yet it's so tempting you brought home a lot of something it's a lot of fun making this noise and so you immediately get the child to make this noise, but you've, you've lost a, a marvelous chance.